what a year it's been and there's only seven days away from Christmas hands up all those who can't wait oh yeah and some big ones too yeah good on you and may you enjoy it where it's a great time especially for family when they can gather together now hands up all those that wish it was all over <laughs> uh, yes particularly parents I think all the running around and uh, getting stuff together well such as the the nature of Christmas Christmas is perhaps the most celebrated occasion or event in the history of mankind most nations around the world will take their people anyway will take time to celebrate Christmas you'll find uh, people even at the South Pole having Christmas together there are people that live at the South Pole all year round and uh, they'll be celebrating Christ Christmas even Russia will be celebrating Christmas this year we hear that there'll be no New Year in Russia just Christmas they cancelled the New Year so I'm so glad that they're going to honour Christ we live in a troubled world but people in every language around the world will be worshipping our Lord Jesus Christ both young and old we're told that Christmas is for children aren't we it's for kids you know I read somewhere that it's the adults through some statistics that I found it's the adults that spend the most money at Christmas it's adults who attend the most Christmas parties it's adults who eat the most food strange it's the adults that drink the most alcohol it's the adults that receive the most expensive gifts such as Christmas Christmas is also I believe the most misunderstood event of Christmas right around the world many nations will be celebrating Christmas just this week I received and I think it was last week I received the Bible Society newsletter and uh, I began to read it and I was staggered to read some statistics on the back here that they took a survey of children in New Zealand and uh, parents and found that 70% of our children never heard the Christmas story from their parents. In other words, mum and dad had not shared the wonder of Christmas story with their children. Sure, they'd celebrated Christmas together, but they hadn't taken the time to tell the story of Christmas to their children. So Bible Society are printing 71,000 little booklets called The Incredible Promise and they're being circulated out through our young people through the schools and I guess that's almost happened by now very few families take the time to worship our Lord Jesus Christ and I'm thankful to see so many here this morning that want to praise and worship God and his son the Lord Jesus Christ because it's a special occasion the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ People want the celebration of Christmas, but without the Christ. They enjoy all the trappings, but they don't want the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but have you seen this ad pop up on TV? Farmers, the home of Christmas. Really? I was staggered. I thought, gosh... I actually knew the founder of Farmers Trading Company, as it used to be called before it was morphed into the farmers, Robert A. Laidlaw. He was a very godly man. And uh, he lectured us at uh, Bible school when we were there. And uh, he, the Bible College of New Zealand is now named after him, the Laidlaw Bible College of New Zealand. A wonderful Christian man, and uh, I'm sure that's not would have been what he approved because I don't believe farmers is the home of Christmas. In fact, he was so convinced about our Lord Jesus Christ being the Lord of all the earth that he wrote a little booklet called The Reason Why 
Why should we believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? This book has been circulated around the world in 30 languages and in millions that have been printed. This is my copy, and if you've never read it, I want to give it to you today. Come and ask me for it, and it's yours, on one condition that you will pass it on for somebody else to read. Okay, so there's a deal. Somebody can have this little booklet, read what Robert Laidlaw wrote to all his staff at the farmer's trading company, as it used to be known, and uh, that's yours. Christmas is also the great decisive event in history. I was reading an article in the newspaper and I came across these words which I thought were worthy of writing down. He called it, the def Christmas is the defining point, the defining point of history and I believe that to be true. Anyone who studies uh, the scriptures will find that certainly, and history, will certainly find that the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ is the turning point of history. So the Bible is the only real source that we can go to to find out what Christmas is all about. So if parents are going to tell their children about it, they have to get into this book because it's the only one that explains Christmas and it's worth telling our children about so they can tell their children's children and so on. And that's the purpose of it. Now we could be looking at many scriptures that are important about Christmas today to understand it and I've um, purposefully chosen just one of them and called it the incredible announcement because I believe it is God's incredible announcement to mankind found in Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 20 if you want to follow me through uh, on some of the verses that we're going to read there I will put them on the screen as we go What made this announcement so incredible? What's so important about this announcement that we've already had read to us in the scripture reading and we've sung about? So important. Well, I believe as I thought it through, there's four real reasons why I think it's incredible and why we should sit up and take note of it this morning. The first one is the circumstances that surrounded the event are incredible. Verses 8 and 9, if you want to follow it in your Bible. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The circumstances are governed by a number of things. First of all, the timing of this announcement. If you study the Bible, you'll realize there's a big gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament, probably 450 years, at least 400. Depends what sort of historian you're reading, but at least this 400 gap. God had made his last statement to the people of God, the Jewish people, through the prophet Malachi, in the Old Testament and you can read about them what he had to say to them and it's not very encouraging news they were falling apart as a nation uh, they were becoming disobedient to God and God was going to deal with them but there are also promises of hope in that book but 400 years went by before God spoke again and then there's a whole flurry of activity as we read through the early chapters of Matthew and uh, the book of Luke we find there the angel of the Lord appearing to Zechariah in the temple when he went to make the offering which was made once a year for the sacrifice of the nation called the Day of Atonement. And uh, as he was in there, then an angel appeared to him and told him that his wife was going to bear a son who was to become John and he had to name him as John. And uh, they were very old and he sort of didn't quite believe and so he was struck dumb. And eventually the child did arrive and uh, he was named John and we know him as John the Baptist. He was the forerunner, the one to announce the good news that the Messiah was coming. The one that actually pointed out and said, behold, 
the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, which Neville just, sorry, Colin just mentioned. I spent many times with, ne uh, with Neville, his brother, and I, they're so much alike, I get them mixed up, they're like twins. Sorry about that, Colin. Anyhow, the history is the very defining point for this great event to take place. God broke his silence. And the uh, next thing, we find that the angels are appearing to Mary, the, just a teenage girl, to tell her that she could be the mother of the child who was to be Messiah, and asking permission if, they could, if God could use her body. And she gave him permission and said, let it be. And so it was. She saw an angel which announced this to her. Pretty scary stuff for a teenager, isn't it? And then there was Joseph. He was a bit uh, shocked by the events that were going to come about when he found out that Mary was pregnant and he thought that he could just put her away quietly and, and uh, see how it could all be covered up. But then the angel spoke to Joseph and said to Joseph that he was to name this new child the name of Jesus, who was to be the saviour. Jesus actually means saviour, and Jesus is the New Testament re rendering of Joshua. So when you read about Joshua in the Old Testament, you're actually using the words of translated into English, saviour, and the same with the word, the Greek word Jesus. Finally, God speaks in this remarkable passage of scripture through the shepherds. It was nine months later and the news was that Jesus had been born. So the timing was fantastic. Where are we? I think we've gone. Here we are. Can we go back um, to the first slide, the first announcement, number one? Right. So we got the first point that we made, and the timing was right. The next thing we're going to look at, or the thing we looked at, if I go back to my notes. Right, the second point that I wanted to make is the messenger. The messenger was an angel. God didn't send the religious elite or a prophet or anybody else. He chose to send an angel. And so the angel's activity at this time is remarkable because uh, that was God's choice. He wanted them to know about it. Uh, an angel appeared to Zechariah and so on as we saw. Then the next point that I want to make here is the glory. It says that glory shone around and it's been suggested by commentators who know more than I do that this glory was the same glory that appeared in the temple in the Old Testament which we call the Shekinah glory or more correctly the Shekinah glory. The glory that was over the temple by fire by day and by cloud by night and in the day of Solomon it filled the temple that he had built this glorious house for God and so it indicates that God himself was present and his glory shone around he was here to announce this great event to the shepherds and that brings me to the next one that we need to see in this uh, passage is the shepherds. The shepherds in those days were the nobodies. Now they're the wealthy people of society, aren't they? Thousands of sheep to look after, and if the sheep price is good and the wool price is good, then we have wealthy farmers. If it's not, then we have crying farmers, or something like that. But they were the nobodies, the what we call today the bottom feeders, the ones that weren't even allowed to give testimony in any court of, a, uh, 
of appeal or anything. They were regarded as non-reliable, smelly people that lived out and virtually the outcasts of society. So why did God choose shepherds? Well, if you read your Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, you find that God is even referred to as a shepherd himself. He shepherded the people of Israel. And uh, shepherds are mentioned right throughout Scripture in a good um, light. So it was God's purpose that he should reveal his message to shepherds. They were earthly people in touch with reality, honest. And then the circumstances were incredible because of the place that occurred. It occurred where Jesus had been born was where the King David had also been born. Bethlehem was the city of David, the birthplace of David. And so it's very important to understand. It was interesting just going back and thinking about these fields of Bethlehem. The fields of Bethlehem where Mo the Moabites, uh, Ruth, came to dwell under the wings of the Almighty God. And she came with Naomi to uh, live with her in the land of Israel and in the fields of Bethlehem. It was in the fields of Bethlehem that she gleaned. It was in the fields of Bethlehem that she met Boaz, the owner of all this land, who was over all the, the reapers and so on. It was Boaz whom she married. And uh, her name is recorded, if you read Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1 of Matthew, her name is recorded as being in the line of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remarkable. Here's an outsider being brought in not just to Israel, but into the very line of the Messiah. And uh, that's how important it was. It was in these fields that David, as a shepherd boy, was looking after sheep, watching over them, when the prophet Samuel came to his father's house, looking for the one that he had to anoint, which God had appointed king. And eventually, after he'd been through all the sons, he said, no, it was, wasn't any of those. So they went and called for David, who was out in the sheep, looking after the sheep, and brought him in from these very fields in to be anointed. And Samuel recognized this was the one appointed by God. He had a, a heart that was after God. No doubt it was in these fields that many of the inspirational psalms had their foundation that he wrote the book of Psalms. So it's in these fields where our God chose to reveal to shepherds, the nobodies, the great message or the announcement that he had for all the people. Now we get to the second point. The second part of the passage is that the announcement itself was incredible. The contents of it, as we read in verses 10 to 12. Verse 10, read with me. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. There's five things I want you to notice in this statement because it's most remarkable. First, there were words of comfort. It said that they were afraid in the previous reading and the first thing that the angel says, don't be afraid. You know, fear had gripped man right from the very point that he sinned in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. It said they were afraid. They feared God because of what they had done. And when God came knocking on the door, they hid themselves from him. They were afraid to approach him. And it's interesting that now God is here announcing a cure for man's fears. No longer need to be afraid of what God might do to us or think of us when we disobey and when we sin. Here is comfort. Don't be afraid. And we'll get that as we go on through this little passage. So words of comfort. There was words of hope said, I bring you good news. That's good news we've been singing about, which actually that Maori song, or about the Maori, was about uh, Samuel Marsden, who came to Marsden Point 
uh, Florence and I had the privilege of going up there earlier in the year and walking down and to see the cross there and just to meditate the, the, the wonder of that event as he stood up on Christmas Day and announced the good news. He, and this was his text, Behold, I bring you good news, tidings of great joy. That was the Christmas Day message when Samuel Marsden preached it at Marsden Point. A message of hope. Then it says there were words of joy. That will cause great joy to all the people. And I love that Christmas carol that sings, Joy to the world, the King has come. Amen. He has come. And that's what the message is here. He didn't come to the religious elite or the celebrities or the politicians, but to all the people. And that's who the news is for. All the people. It's inclusive, including the Russians. Believe it or not, anybody, the most vilest of person, can find forgiveness. Isaac Newton found forgiveness, the great slave trader who found Christ and was forgiven by God for all his sin. God can forgive us. And this is the great joy that we receive from God. Then there were words of revelation. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah Lord. Now there's three things here, three names of our Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't got time to spend on them. We could probably spend a whole message on them. But the first one is a Savior has been born. And a Savior is somebody who saved somebody. I will remember the story when a car went over the bridge just up the road from where we live over the Mangatapu Bridge and uh, a policeman dived in to save the one person lost their life that was trapped in the car but the other one was saved because the policeman dived over the, the side and uh, managed to get him over to the, uh, in the water and the paramedics were there by their time and I read that uh, their body temperature only had to drop one more degrees before they would have lost their own lives. The body can come down so far, when it reaches that point, which I can't remember what it was, that's the end. And uh, both of them were at that point before they were found and uh, recovered on the side. That, he, that man was a saviour to the boy that managed to get out of the vehicle and uh, was in the water but couldn't swim and couldn't get to the shore. And so the policeman became his saviour. I'm glad that he was given a bravery award because that was a brave thing to do. So that's the meaning of saviour. Then our Lord Jesus Christ is called Messiah. Now Messiah is the Hebrew word for Christ, he is the Christ, is the Greek word. So it gets a little bit muddled here, and then we've got two or three languages here. He's the Messiah, which was the Hebrew word for Messiah, uh, for Christ, which is the Greek word, which really means the anointed one or the appointed one of God. So when we look at uh, this term that he's referred to as Messiah, then we've got to think of as the one that is appointed by God. And he had been spoken of for hundreds of years that he was promised. And eventually he arrives. Then he's called Lord. And as far as I can fathom, this means that he's sovereign over everything. Sovereign over creation. Sovereign over mankind. Sovereign over anything that we can see. Or the things that we can't see. A sovereign Lord. He's Lord over all those things. So an amazing revelation in that statement which you could ponder on for hours. Then there were words of encouragement. Look what it says. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. It wasn't just words that they had to hang on to, but it was words that they could react to. And they decided to go and check it out. We'll look a bit that. Uh, in our last point you will find a baby there was assurance in these words, uh, verses that they would find the one that was the saviour the lord the messiah 
brings us to the third part of this uh, marvellous statement. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with an angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest in heaven and peace to those whom his favour rests. The revelation was incredible. The heavenly hosts appeared. They couldn't hold their peace any longer. In fact, um, this word could be for heavenly hosts could be translated the heavenly armies that God has at his disposal to do his will. So the heavenly armies or the heavenly hosts, which outnumber anything that we could imagine, began to sing praise and glory to God. And that was his purpose, to glorify God. I love the old hymn that says, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. God is glorified, and rightly so, and that's our duty to glorify him as well. Let's catch up. And the third thing is that they declared peace for those who found favour with God. How do we find favour with God? It's by believing that the one that was born in a manger was Christ the Lord, the one who was our saviour. By believing on him, then we find favour with God and then we'll understand what real peace is, peace with God and the peace of God which can reign in our lives. Finally, let me say that the response to the shepherds was incredible. Verses 15 verse, uh, to verse 20. Let me read them to you. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all that heard it were amazed and this what had the shepherds had said to them but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told the reaction of the shepherds is threefold. First of all, we have to congratulate them. They investigated what they had been told. They just didn't take it for granted and leave it for history to deal with. They said, let's check it out. Let's go and see it. You know, it's an, a marvel characteristic, and that's what our world is failing to do, failing to check out what all these lights and trees and everything else represent. We have to admire these men they had the audacity to go check out what they had seen. You know, our society is overloaded by the media which distracts them and by all this chatter that goes on, blinded, blinded by the bling of Christmas that the retailers have, retailers have forced on us. And of course we know who behind that is the devil, Satan himself, because he wants to distract our attention from what Christmas is really all about. It's all about our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoops. Secondly, they shared what they saw. You know, they gossiped the good news. They told not only Mary, but anybody who wanted to listen what they had seen. You know, your testimony is the most powerful thing you have. And my testimony is the most powerful thing I have. Not what he says about me but what happened in my heart that I can share with others. And you know, people will respect that. They won't challenge your experience with God. And uh, if you don't know how to share that, well, just think of what God's done for you and find a way of sharing with them that good news. That's just what the shepherds did. They saw, they heard, and they shared their experience. Amazing, and we're able to enjoy it today. And then it says, they went on their way rejoicing because they were so glad I came across this poem which was sent to me just this week uh, from Reach Beyond and it's written by a good guy called Bruce 
And as I read it, I thought, that's exactly where I want to go this morning. So let's read it together. Just as when he first appeared, a baby unobserved, his approach is secret still. Christ, our Lord, the Word. In a fraught, distracted world, so easy to ignore, yet he brings us light and life when we unlock the door. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, so much to say about these verses that we struggle to incorporate everything that you wanted us to learn. But we thank Father, we thank you for Luke who penned these words, inspired by your Holy Spirit to put down those things which we needed to know. We thank you for the story of just shepherds, just nobodies, looking after their sheep, that you revealed this tremendous announcement to. Incredible. The news that on that very day had been born a saviour for all people. Thank you that he became our Messiah. Thank you that he's our Christ. Thank you that he's our saviour. We've been able to remember that this morning. But thank you too that he is our Lord. We submit ourselves to you and we look forward to the time when he will be Lord of all, King of kings, Lord of lords, come in, in his glory. So we just ask your blessing upon these people as they enjoy Christmas together with families. For those that don't have families or are unable to be with them, we pray that you would be close to them too and uplift their hearts with the wonder of the message of Christmas. May it thrill their hearts. May it excite them. And may the thrill of Jesus grip us as we enter a new year in your will, 19, uh, 2023. So, Father, we just commit this service to you and thank you for the music we've been able to sing together for the glory of your name and in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.